Welcome everyone. My name is David Wood and I chair London Futurists. Our topic today is cryptocurrencies for profound good? Question mark. And we'll be looking at the particular case of the recently launched transhuman coin. There's a lot of debate and even controversy over the subjects of cryptocurrencies, blockchain, and decentralized autonomous organizations. Supporters of these concepts see them as a significant stepping stone to a better future. Critics point to what they see as examples of hype, irrational exuberance, get-rich-quick Ponzi schemes, wasteful use of natural resources by energy-intensive crypto mining operations, and the way in which some people have lost considerable sums of money from their ill-advised crypto investments or storing their crypto assets in an unwise way. But it's no surprise that a set of truly disruptive new technologies gives rise to considerable confusion and misunderstanding in their relatively early days. To help sort out some of that confusion and misunderstanding, today we are joined by three of the leadership team of the recently launched Transhuman Coin. Peter Jing and Elise Su, who are connecting from Sydney, where it's already 11 p.m. at night, and Charles Awuzi, who is connecting from Johannesburg, where it's the more civilized time of 3 p.m. in the afternoon. They'll each introduce themselves in a moment, briefly, before we get down to a deeper investigation of how to design, structure, and operate a cryptocurrency so that profound good is likely to result. So let's uh, throw the floor briefly to Charles. Hi, everybody. My name is Charles Awuze, and I'm a resident in South Africa. I'm part of the developer team of the Transhuman Coin. I am a biochemist by training, a cyber security expert by profession, and I'm CEO and CTO of Gamesburg Group in South Africa. It's good to have you all today. Thank you, David. Thanks, Charles. Let's say uh, move to Elise. Thanks, David. Hey, everyone. Um, like David said, it is 11 p.m. here on a Saturday night, but this is my idea of a Saturday night, actually, talking about tech. This is exactly what I love. So I am a software engineer at Palo IT. I am also on the board of Singularity U Australia and also um, for the Lifeboat Foundation as well. And also I do other things like run a community called Transhumanism Australia. So we invest and educate in science and technology to um, extend our healthy life or even just to um, uh, just look at what emerging technologies that can help us, um, I guess, go beyond the, the limitations of our human biology. So I recently just joined the dev team of Transhuman Coin, but I was just really excited about the philosophy and what the team wanted to achieve. So I, I was ready to jump on board. Well, it's great that you're here. The third member of the panel today is Peter Shing. Uh, Peter, over to you. Thanks, David. As Elise said, uh, thanks for letting us nerd out on a Saturday night over here in Sydney. Um, I work, my day job is in technology data innovation at KPMG. Um, I'm part of the faculty at Singularity University on transhumanism and emerging tech. And uh, also I'm part of the executive at Science Party in Australia. Um, so yeah, it's a pleasure to be part of here today. Um, thank you, David, for giving us the audience. I recently joined the management team at Transhuman Coin because I finally found something that actually drive this movement through a financial incentive, but also something that we can actually make donations today to all the things that Elise mentioned, whether it's increasing our healthy human lifespan, enhancing our intelligence, and also our well-being uh, beyond the human condition limitations. Great. Well, maybe we can talk about some of these other topics as well in the Q&A in due course, such as the science party, which uh, sounds uh, fascinating. But uh, why don't you run through some uh, presentation on the transhuman coin, bringing us all bang up to date? Yeah, thanks for uh, giving us the audience again, David. And um, I'm just going to go through what are the topics we'll be covering today. Uh, what is transhuman coin? Um, how does it grow the transhumanism movement? Um, how will the coin grow itself as part of the community? And um, yeah, 
continue to go on about the supporting team members that will be accumulating as well that will be joining the management team. Um, how do we buy the transhuman coin and also the upcoming milestones uh, of this coin as well. So, uh, in its simplest form, um, if we remember how Bitcoin began, it has now become a digital gold and uh, essentially as a store of value, Bitcoin has become the go-to in terms of decentralizing money itself. Um, we see that um, companies are now accumulating Bitcoin on their balance sheet as a store of value. And we're seeing that this is also being built up on, on layer two technologies like Lightning to become a payment system. So it is the original gangster of the cryptocurrency is Bitcoin. What we've added as well is from Ethereum and uh, the upcoming Ethereum 2.0, uh, essentially enabling smart contracts. So we'll go into the tokenomics of transhuming coin in a second, but really bringing on that evolution uh, from what Bitcoin was taking in Ethereum and as it goes to the staking mechanism in the Ethereum 2.0. And thirdly, there's Dogecoin. You know, what started out as a joke and essentially a meme of Shiba Inu, um, this has actually gained support, you know, with the likes of Elon Musk supporting this movement and actually turning that into a payment system with Vitalik Buterin, who founded Ethereum as well, now on the board uh, to essentially drive Dogecoin. And so we think that the, the mimetic value of cryptocurrencies to have that community and actually drive that as a cryptocurrency and its adoption also brings value. And fourthly, obviously, it's going to be transhumanism as a movement. Now, I know transhumanism has been very disparate in lots of different segregations, where it's scientific transhumanism, or you've got um, you know, singularity networks and things like that. There is still lacking a single financial metric that we can actually get behind in the form of a cryptocurrency for transhumanism, something that's dedicated to the transhuman movement. And this is where transhuman coin begins. So THC is the, uh, the official coin token, but we'll get into that as well. Um, I hand it over to Charles just to give a, an overview of his journey on uh, how Transhuman Coin began and what it is as well and how it works. Thank you, Peter. First of all, we, we, we are first transhumanists, you know, and a good friend of mine shared the idea with Jenny. And um, she, she was like, look, Charles, what if we start a project, a crypto project, you know, that will donate to the movement and, and donate to charity at the same time while funding research and um, helping the, the average uh, investor to grow their investment. You know, and I was like, that's smart. That's really smart. And um, that was how I came on board, you know. But like I said to you, Peter, I, I did not make it public, you know, until I was sure that the liquidity pool was locked, you know, and all the I's, we are dotted, and all the T's, we are crossed, and everything um, was safe and good to go. And as a cybersecurity expert, you know, and let's make sure that we, we, we are rock pool proof, you know. And what I mean by that is that um, we, we, we have done our homework to avoid investors losing their investments. You know, I'm a very popular um, figure in Africa, and I wouldn't want anything to um, jeopardize my integrity. So I, once I got all that sorted out, I, I went public with my um, passion with, for the, the transhuman coin, you know. And glad enough, we, we formed a great team, you know. Peter Zing, Ali Su, myself, Jenny, and... Um, the, 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 the new moderators on the Telegram group, you know, and we formed a, a great team and we, we, we got the project going, you know, and right now we, we are at two point, about $2.4 million market cap and, and that's a great leap so far. So thank you so much, Peter. Thank you, Dr. Charles. And uh, thank you for uh, also working with Jenny to getting uh, Elise and I on board. We too also were a bit reluctant at so, you know, with the cryptocurrency at the start. But after that call with yourself and Jenny and understanding the tokenomics and seeing the wallets uh, on the blockchain, yeah, that's what really gave us confidence to get behind it and put our faces to it too. The tokenomics um, essentially is total supply of 7 billion. So similar how Bitcoin has a maximum number of supply, this is also the maximum number of coins that will be issued in total. 
And, you know, if you think about 7 billion, the, the goal is to have every single person on the planet to become a supporter of transhumanism. And that's, that's where that number is sort of trying to get to. Uh, we want everyone to be a holder of transhuman coin. And the way the tokenomics works is that 2% of the transactions are essentially goes to that liquidity pool that Charles mentioned. So that's a locked pool of liquidity so that you can get in and out of transhuman coin if you wish to. So that allows that uh, continual transfer so that people don't have to be worried um, that um, there won't be any liquidity to get in and out of the coin. 2% goes to the existing holders. This means that the longer you hold, the more you'll be rewarded. And so this way it sort of incentivizes long-term holding and ensures that no one tries to, you know, to try to do the transactions too quickly to take advantage of volatility. So we want to make sure that we can reward the holders, but also prevent the sort of speculative trading on this coin as well. And ultimately the whole point of having this as well in the transactions of 2% 2 going to a donation wallet of a transhuman coin. And we're already making contact with the, uh, the logos here we've seen below with Missile Earth Foundation, with uh, Lifespan.io, Buck Institute and Garvin Institute. We're looking to make our first donations with the transaction of these uh, in the transhuman wallet. We know that um, cryptocurrencies is uh, starting to make some traction. We've already saw your <laughs> talk earlier with Aubrey de Grey, uh, and essentially, um, David, uh, you, you're talking about how the Pulse chain essentially created the airdrops um, through the donations to Sound Foundation, and uh, what that traction got to was 20, over $25 million in donations uh, to the Sense Foundation. Now, Lifespan.io is working with VitaDAO as well. So this is a decentralized autonomous organization that is funding early stage longevity research. And they're using a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization to uh, enforce that. I think that's a great initiative, but we're still missing that dedicated token for the transhumanism movement. There is the super intelligence component, the super well-being component, and uh, longevity itself in its simplest form, this transhuman coin can just be hodled to essentially be uh, that value generated throughout time as well. And with Methuselah Foundation, uh, Dogelon Mars, they are now the stewards of Dogelon Mars, which essentially started off as a main coin, a fork of Dogecoin. Uh, but then um, they, they actually issued half of that to Vitalik and Vitalik Buterin decided to donate that to Methuselah Foundation. And so rather than thinking that those coins were burned, it became a charity token by default when half of it was actually donated to Methuselah Foundation. And now they're actually a steward of that coin, but it's not a dedicated transhumanism movement and it never started, uh, began to be. So uh, this is something that we want to actually create and the tokenomics to actually incentivize to happen. Before we move on, I just wanted to answer some of the questions in the chat. So uh, Didier, you mentioned if there was any contact with Humanity Plus or other transhumanist organizations. So we are planning on making contact with more organizations going forward. So the, the four logos that you see up on the screen, Life Extension Advocacy Foundation um, and so on, those are just the ones that we have been able to make contact with and um, and we're just looking at how we can work with them at the, at the first instance. But then going forward, we do want to make contact with as many transhumanist organizations as possible. Um, also, Alexandria, you also mentioned if we would consider funding transhumanist advocacy, advocacy groups. Uh, certainly, that's something that we'll look into as well. So pretty much anything that fits under the transhumanist banner where they're doing something for good. Um, or, and, and also, especially if they're not-for-profit or charity organisation, they're definitely, uh, they would qualify for our, our um, dispersal of transhuman coin. Um, so also I should mention that it's, it, it's actually going to be community-driven, especially by the largest token holders of THC. Thanks so much, Elise. Yeah, and we're just getting started. So yeah, we're already starting to make those initial donations. You know, advocacy groups like Transhumanism Australia is a holder of transhuman coins. So yeah, definitely we'll be looking out for other advocacy groups like Humanity Plus and, uh, and others as well. So yeah, thank you so much. And this is the forum for us to actually uh, do our outreach. We've only just started to do this uh, marketing campaign. So uh, yeah, it'd be great to actually be going in contact to get those donations going. 
Uh, yeah, hopefully you, Charles. Uh, on the tokenomics, oh great, on the donation of prosthetic legs to um, on the privileged Africans. Now, we are not just going to be donating to established organizations, you know. Um, we are also going to go directly to um, the underprivileged people who may not have access to um, or to benefit from the big organizations. So we are going to take our donations directly to um, people like the people you see on the screen right there. You know, we're going to um, get prosthetic legs across people like that. We are going to um, assist children who are struggling with um, um, genetic disorders, you know, to get good medical care, you know, especially the underprivileged children, you know. So we are going to make direct, um, direct donations, which will be streamed live for transparency. So we're going to stream it. We, it, it will be community driven. So we go in the community um, on, on our Telegram group. We have a polling system that allows the community to um, propose and nominate um, people who are underprivileged or people who deserve to be helped or assisted by the project. You know, and, and, and the team would locate such people wherever they are and give them the, the right um, life enhancement technology that they, they deserve. So yes, we would be donating prosthetic legs to underprivileged Africans, we'll be assisting uh, underprivileged children who have um, genetic disorders or other life-threatening medical conditions to get you know, good medical care. And we're gonna be doing a lot of um, direct charity work. So thank you, Peter. I hope that explains it. Yeah, thank you, Charles. And you know, just we'll be partnering up with the best in the community, like um, Open Bionics. I just wanted to mention that we'd love to talk to Open Bionics. So if anyone has any contacts, we'd love them. Um, I think it would be a really uh, project that would be fit for this. So where it's both customized but also lower cost compared to the normal manufacturing process. So uh, this is really a slide on what's happening, um, you know, in Africa's quite cryptic currency revolution. Um, you know, as Charles was uh, mentioning to me before, um, you know, countries like Nigeria, because of the centralized banking system and the corruptions and the failures that's happening, uh, we're actually seeing a lot of African nations move to cryptocurrencies because they were a mobile first uh, 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 state of nations. Essentially, they've essentially moved and transcended um, all the current existing banking infrastructure that we have in the West, in Western countries. And uh, you can see here, there's over, over 60 crypto wallets and exchanges companies in Africa, um, uh, from the likes of Binance are there already, the Roku's, and, uh, you know, got uh, a bunch of crypto exchanges that are essentially acting as the new financial systems <laughs> they've got there, because holding fiat in Africa actually is very risky, <laughs> even relative to crypto at certain times. Um, and we've got uh, Dr. Charles Dramming, the transhumanism agenda um, over there. He's got over 60,000 followers there. And you can see the transhumanist Africa communities are happening. We've got um, contributions in Immortalers magazine. And Singularity U South Africa is also um, getting a lot of traction. We've had Exponential Africa last year. We've had um, just coming up, Igniting Africa's Future. This is Singularity U South Africa's uh, summit online. And so, yeah, because of this sort of presence, we're actually seeing a huge drive uh, in cryptocurrency and transhumanism adoption in Africa. Um, yeah, and Charles, yeah, uh, talk to some of these figures that we see here as well. So, like I said to you, Peter, before uh, we came live, we, we are seeing a massive um, crypto revolution in Africa, especially in Nigeria. And, and mm. that, that has to do with Unfortunately, with the um, collapse or seeming um, uh, failure in the financial systems, you know, so people are um, looking for alternatives, you know, alternative ways to um, invest and transact, you know, and there is also a need for people to um, send money, you know, from one person to the other, you know, forex in Nigeria is crazy. It's something I don't want to experience, you know, so. 
with with the, with, with the revolution with the revolution that cryptocurrency brings. So people are able to transact. They are able to you know transfer money from one person to the other without going through the hassle of um, the, the the forex system in Nigeria. And and that allows one one guy to buy a product in under, you know in in Africa to buy a product in somewhere in the world you know um, without being told that we don't have enough forex we don't have enough for you know no enough foreign exchange for that transaction you know we have that happening in Zimbabwe in in, in Nigeria and other parts of Africa and that contributes to the um, traction we see in um, cryptocurrency adoption in Africa and now what we're doing is that we are tapping into that massive trading that is going on in Africa that crypto trading you know we we we, are, we we created um the transhuman coin to be able to tap into that trade and fund be, and, and they become able to fund transhumanism as a movement you know um anti aging um you talk about the longevity projects that that we have our eyes on it you know and like I've read in the chat just here you know someone was asking if we are going to fund um, transhumanist um um i think advocacy groups yes we like like alice explained we are gonna fund you know um advocacy groups of transhumanism you know and, and that's 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 vision so we turn into that um massive market to fund um transhumanism so thank you so much yeah, so in, in terms of the value proposition of transhuman coin, how we essentially be growing with more holders, um, the view is that, um, you know, I think, David, you asked me this on our, on our Facebook exchange where, you know, what, what's the point of transhuman coin when you've got the likes of Longevity Vision Fund uh, or Juvenescence, which has a portfolio of these, you know, life extension companies. And, you know, we just recently saw the, the eighth aging research and drug discovery meeting happening. And there was just a raft of amazing developments in aging research. Well, that's the thing. Everyday investors and everyday transhumanists and the people in the communities can't invest in these private funds. I know they can if they become an accredited investor, um, if they're sophisticated enough to actually get into these private funds, um, or even in public markets, it's hard to actually get access to the US stock exchanges. So what we envision for Transhuman Coin is to be donated to the balance sheets of these organizations. And this way, the organizations can hold Transhuman Coin and still mark that up to the market value of the Transhuman Coin. So they get this, they can actually increase the value on their balance sheet and they can actually use that to, whether it's to obtain loans, to make acquisitions, it increases the market value of those companies. At the same time, your everyday community members can drive Transhuman Coin's value by purchasing Transhuman Coin, supporting all these holders of Transhuman Coin in terms of these private organizations. And we can continue on to drive publicly listed companies like Intelia, CRISPR, and Editas, these CRISPR companies that are essentially going to change the world in the genomic revolution. And we can do this already with Moderna and Pfizer and BioNTech with the mRNA technologies that they have that's actually you know, solving a lot of these issues that we're having with COVID, um, which is going to need booster shots as well coming up. Um, this company, publicly listed companies like Unity Biotech, you know, we need to look at senescence um, research and how do we actually use um, Google's technology in DeepMind to drive drug discovery and protein folding um, and also super intelligence. So these publicly listed companies like OpenAI and uh, whether it's Tesla as well and, and Microsoft. So these are the companies that we want to hold transhuman coin because we want them to actually support the transhumanist movement. And we know Elon Musk has got that sort of future vision of super intelligence. We got to get him to come around as well on the longevity side, because from his recent tweets, I've just seen that, you know, he thinks that still with a deathless mindset that, you know, he needs a, a, a clock to win before he actually finds meaning in life. We need to help solve that as well and getting him on board with the transhumanist movement on the longevity side. In terms of the currently growing management team, um, seeing Dr. Charles, myself and Elise, and we've got Jenny and the community members at Transhumanism Australia that's helping with the Telegram as well. 
um, but essentially we're going to bring on more and more transhuman influences and uh, Dr. Charles can announce those as well in the coming days um, and I'll be reaching out to Australian members, for example, the Aging Decelerator that we have with Carl Walker and, um, and all the venture capital uh, contacts that we have as well and try to actually get them to fund uh, transhuman related projects uh, in the form of startups, get those startups to hold transhuman coin too. Uh, this is actually just on how to buy transhuman coin so right now it's listed on PancakeSwap, which is the binance smart chain so you can swap your binance coin for transhuman coin you essentially just need to go and uh, go to the website transhuman.finance copy the contract address and uh, paste that in to import that um, you'll need a other metamask or trust wallet or other hot wallet that you can connect to when you go to PancakeSwap and uh, that allows you to transfer and because it's such an early project just increase your slippage to 10 percent and that allows for that uh, liquidity to go through uh, in terms of our roadmap this is where we're at uh, we've already completed the approval of the core developments we've launched the public site and uh, listed on the pancake swap uh, we've also got the white paper just recently uh, released as well thanks charles for getting that through and uh what's happening now charles um we're doing the, the promotion campaign we're doing the marketing campaign it's still just in progress just starting out um and this recently that's coming up as well we'll be listing on the crypto exchange coins bit um so yeah charles uh, remind us um, when when that's happening as well yeah we are listening on coinsbeats.io on um the uh, i think the eighth which is this one is this coming one is you know, it's coming I, I, I don't know if, if I was supposed to make this public, but <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, it's out there. So we are getting listed on a major um, centralized exchange, you know, um, on, the, on this one, so that the announcement will be made by coins, coinsbeats.io on their website and on um, all their platforms, I think on Tuesday or Wednesday. Okay, great. So and we just made an announcement on David's <laughs> London Futures webinar. Uh, yeah. And so this is, uh, you know, this is to get around, um, you know, the challenges people have. It's very tech, you need to be really tech savvy to be able to, you know, use pancake swap and transfer your, your Binance coin into your wallet uh, to do that. So, yeah, this will make it a lot more accessible um, yeah, using a centralized exchange. Um, and then, yeah, we're targeting other exchanges one by one at a time. So in the future, we can look at uh, Binance and Coinbase as well. But, uh, yeah, the upcoming... Um, milestones i guess we've got essentially is to continue to make our first donations and um, buy back and burn weekly it's just to, to continue to drive uh, the adoption um listing on coin gecko um and also market cap coin market cap as well so that actually brings a lot more prominence of this coin to the crypto community um, and yeah, and phase four is essentially listing more on more L banks and buck swap partnerships. It's going to be a transhuman coin lottery. And what's most exciting is going to be this uh, transhumanism research center. And uh, this is all about, um, we'll get to that in a sec, but actually by 2023, we actually want to create a research center dedicated to transhumanism. Um, and we, able to, we want to form partnerships with the amazing uh, work that's been done in the new blockchains as well as existing ones. Uh, for example, we mentioned Pulse Chain from Richard Hart's work as well recently, um, and also the Binance Smart Chain. Um, Binance Smart Chain, you know, it sacrifices uh, decentralization for efficient energy usage. So from an ESG perspective, I think it's a lot more efficient um, in using energy. But we want to make sure that um, it is secured in the future as well for that decentralization. So Ethereum 2.0 and Cardano with uh, Vitalik Buterin being an avid supporter of longevity and Chris <laughs> and uh, Charles Hodgson, um, they're essentially supporting longevity as well. Um, and there's also Singularity Net with Ben Goetz and um, how we can actually connect in with the super intelligence side of things. Uh, and Proof of Humanity, it's an amazing initiative where they've funded a, a UBI coin. And that's something that you can actually validate that you are a human on the Ethereum blockchain, but also connect that to uh, to get a UBI, one UBI per hour. I think it's at about um, five cents at the moment, but I think it's actually really good to actually have an initiative to drive UBI right now. And yeah, so yeah, Charles, talk us more about the Transhuman Research Center. This this are our major goal. Um, I'll say a bit of a long term goal, and that is to um, build, you know, a Transhuman Research Center, 
you know, we should become the hub of innovation for major transhuman projects around the world, you know. And the, the location of that would be uh, decided on by the uh, management team and um, a, a, a polling by the community, you know, uh, using the polling system um, in the community. And we, we are hoping that by 2023, we should commence the um, project on the building of the Transhuman Research Center. This is going to be like a massive leap in the transhumanism movement. You know, it's going to be a major leap. And, but that's, that's the goal. That's the goal. That's the vision. You know, that's where we're going to come 2023. Amazing. Thanks, Charles. And yeah, thanks, um, thanks for listening to that presentation. Um, you'll be able to find Transhuman Coin at transhumancoin.finance. Um, yeah, back to you, David, for um, working up some questions. Well, that was very interesting. Thanks so much for setting things out so clearly and engagingly. There are questions. There are questions about how are decisions made. So maybe we'll start there. Because, I mean, you set out lots of attractive possibilities. You might put some charitable donations here. You might put some charitable donations there. But however big your budget is, there's going to have to be decisions, you know. There's, I think, four sets of decisions that uh, are up for grabs. There are which kinds of things do you want to do? Do you want to help the blind to see? Or do you want to put money in for the lame walking? Or raising the dead? Or advocacy? So how do you spread your work across these different uh, possible areas. Secondly, there's how do you decide which uh, investments will be effective? Because um, there's a whole area of study in this. Effective altruism looks at this. You know, many different charitable donations seem to vary quite considerably in their effectiveness. Some of them have high profile and it makes you feel good when you donate to some of these, but they may not actually have such a big impact on the world. So how do you evaluate the effectiveness of possible different donations? And then there's a the political angle because, you know, somebody may say, hey, uh, people are starving, give them fish. Somebody else will say, no, give them fishing rods, teach them how to fish. Somebody else will say, no, come along, change the government. They've got some bad, corrupt government here. You've got to force them to ab apply these political structures. So how do you decide where do you uh, apply your funds along that spectrum? And finally, there's a question that Anton uh, Kaluga has raised in chat. And how radical are you in in uh, choosing uh, projects? I mean, are you interested in uh, projects on head transplantation, for example, or on inserting human brain genes into animals or cryonics? Uh, so, I mean, who makes these decisions? And you've said, well, there's a telegram uh, poll, but I'm not sure I want these hard decisions being made by a random group of people on telegram. So maybe you can talk us through what, how this works today and how it might work in the future. Okay. Um we have a white paper which is published on our, our website and on the um, sixth page of that white paper we, we stated um, the, the process for decision making and that starts with the top investors nominating deserving organizations for donations or reinvestments and uh, after that we go to the community you know because we, we want to drive um, community participation, you know, so we go to the community and that's when we use the um, community polling system to decide which of the nominated, you know, organizations we receive other donations or um, investments. And after that, you know, once we have um, achieved um, that participation by our community, we go back to the top management team, you know, and if, if it's donation, then we have to do I mean, before that, we have done our research on the eligibility, you know, um, are, they, are they honest, you know, are they a transparent organization and are they deserving of this donation, you know, and if we have picked all the bosses, then um, we go ahead and make donation, you know, and that, that defines our decision making process. One, it encourages um, community participation because the project is community driven, you know. And then the donations and, and, and you know, the process of doing that will be life streamed, you know, and that is to promote um, um, transparency. So we do it live. And if we're donating in, in, in um, GSC, and that's a transhuman coin or any um, cryptocurrency, 
um, the blockchain allows you to view every transaction done on the blockchain. So we just share the um, transaction hash, you know, and it's, it's viewable, it's trackable by anyone who has a smartphone. You know, and by the way, to David Wood, thank you so much for being one of the pioneers of the smartphone revolution. You know, a lot of people do not know in Africa that we're sitting right here with one of the men who gave us today what we call um, smartphones. So it's a big thumbs up to you, Mr. David Wood, for all the great work you've done to bring us to where we are in technology. Well, that leads me to say it was hard making lots of decisions about what features to put into smartphones. You know, we had lots of people who said, put in this feature to the next smartphone operating system. No, prioritize security. No, prioritize a real-time performance. No, prioritize support for synchronization on the cloud. And it was not easy to make these decisions. And I think if we'd had some kind of democratic process, I don't think we'd have taken a very good decisions. So I ask again, can you say a bit more about how will these hard decisions be made? When, for example, should a uh, particular percentage being given to LEAF. I mean, LEAF's a great, uh, the Lifespan Advocacy uh, Organization. That's fantastic. Or should we give it to Buck Institute instead? You've said, I think, Charles, that the top investors will make proposals. Well, who are these top investors? And do their proposals have more weight depending on their level of holding they've got? So let, let's stay, stay with this question a bit longer. How, how does it work in practice? Yeah, we, we, do have, we do have a group, you know, we do have a club, if I should use the word, a group of top investors, you know, and, and, and doing that is a strategy that we um, developed to also keep our um, big holders closer, you know, because I saw a question um, from, I think, the chat, um, from, from the Zoom chat, and someone was asking, how do you protect the project against wells? You know, so this is a strategy that we developed. We, we brought our top, our top investors closer, you know, and, and we, we, we made them stakeholders in the projects. You know, that way our, our wells have become um, a, a great asset to us, you know, and not a threat to us, you know, and, 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 and that is a great smart decision by the management team, you know. So yes, we do have a, a top investors club, you know, and they do have such privileges of uh, other nomination of uh, which um, organizations that will receive a donation from the Transhuman Coin, you know. And like you rightly said, Mr. David, you know, uh, you spoke about democratizing um, decision making. Uh, well, in some cases, uh, you know, you, you, you may have to come together you know, and say, hey, Peter, Alice, you know, Jenny Charles, this is a difficult decision to make. But, you know, we are going to depend on um, statistics. We're going to depend on expertise. So we have someone like um, Peter, who is an expert in um, automation technology. This is your, your area. Please um, make this decision based on your expertise. You know, you, you, sh you should be able to give us a very smart advice on the way forward in this area. And, you know, we're going to tap into the um, areas of specific, um, expertise of the top management team, we have um, biochemists, we have um, technologists and software developers like Alice, you know, and, and you know, when projects come, they're going to tap into their um, expertise in decision making, you know. So I think Peter and Alice, you also have something to say about that question. Yeah, no, we thought about um, what's happening around the decentralized autonomous organizations. And like you say, David, if we make it too democratic, you know, you're going to get things that people don't know what they need in the future as well. You need that sort of have that vision at the management level and we'll be essentially guided by our mission statement, which is essentially to accelerate the transhumanism movement, you know, in the, in the lines of super intelligence, super longevity and super well-being. But if there's any point in time where the decisions conflict between say one donation for the other, which one will have a bigger impact on the overall transhumanism movement? That's essentially our goal. And how do we get 7 billion people holding transhuman coin? You know, that's, that's probably where we say mission accomplished because we would have got everyone to support the transhumanist movement. We would have solved aging as a disease. We would have solved our limitations on connecting to super intelligence and also our overall being. So uh, that is our guiding mission statement. I think in cases where there is a massive societal benefit that it is best to have more democratic decision-making 
rather than uh, so so in, using the example of phones um, so that's probably where you can have more just a, a smaller group of people making a decision but when it comes to making decisions about health um, and you know just um, yeah how we can advance our biology then I think we should make it a slightly more democratic decision so let's stay with this question of democracy. Uh, I see there's quite a lively discussion on YouTube on exactly this point now. Maybe I misspoke earlier in saying I didn't approve of a democratic decision. That's not what I meant to say. I'm a big fan of what I call super democracy, which is doing democracy right. But that requires people understanding what they're discussing. And if you rush too quickly to a vote, you may get a bad decision. And there have been quite a few instances in the world in the last few years. And of course, going further back in history too, when uh, democratic decisions uh, were based on an incomplete understanding. And so I do wonder, how do, how, what do you envision as the way to ensure that the discussions are informed by the best insight and take account of multiple points of view rather than being dominated by just a few perspectives like the whales that were mentioned. And for those who don't know, maybe you can uh, des describe what a whale is, but they may have a disproportionate influence. They may spread ideas and understanding which aren't truly in line with the uh, general uh, benefits. So I'll be interested in any of your comments on how you're going to manage this democratic process so it's not dominated by vested interests or other fake news? Well, um, like, like, like I just read that from um, our, just a minute, um, white paper, the, 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 the sixth page on our white paper, you know, we, we described two decision-making processes. So it, it starts with the top investors, but it doesn't end with the top investors. You know, um, I, I can describe that better with what happens with um, the US political system where they have the electoral college and then they have the um, public voters, you know. And in our case, we, we, we've, we've just done the reverse, you know. So we start with the, the uh, electoral college, like the, the smaller group of people, you know, and then we take it to the public, you know, for assessment, you know, and if the public says no, so the, 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 the community functions like the parliament, <laughs> you know, they function like the parliament. If, if, we, if we go to them and then they say, no, we don't, we don't want this, we don't buy into this idea, you know, literally they, they override the top investors, you know, so um, at no point would um, a smaller group have more power than the bigger group. At no point would that happen in the project because we are community driven. So we will remain um, community based, even in decision making. You know. Yeah, and Thank it's you. early. We, we continue to iterate on a from a technology basis as well, and we can incorporate those sort of DAO uh, type of features. But like Charles said, we can actually initiate those initial suggestions from the management team with then that comes to the vote from the community. So we do get that feedback loop from the community to make sure that we are making sure we're not, um, you know, moving against the movement, right? We actually want to accelerate the movement itself. Let's ask a question about the size of the money that's involved here. We've talked about how do we decide how to split up the pie, but there are questions saying, well, how big is the pie? So an anonymous attendee asks, say, what is the income that the THC Foundation will be collecting 6% from? How soon will you be in a state when you'll be allocating a million altogether, for example? So that's one. Didier Cornell, I think, asked the same question. How much money is already there in uh, euros or dollars and how much is ready to be dispersed into these donations uh, soon? First of all, we, we, we do have a wallet, you know, and, and that wallet currently holds THC and that's Transhuman Coin, you know. And right now we, we haven't swapped um, the Transhuman Coin for BNB, we haven't sold anything, you know, so we, we may not be able to, to give the exact value in, in dollars, right? We may not be able to give the exact value in dollars, but we do have um, a tokenomics that sends 2% of every, of every transaction to um, a dedicated Transhuman um, project wallet. And um, coming back to the question of 
what the project is worth now. I mean, the, the market cap is at $2.4 million. So that describes the value of the project. So our value is cut at $2.4 million currently. And we are, you know, foreseeing, after the listing on Wednesday, we are foreseeing a massive growth to over $10 million in the coming week or so. Yeah. But even with $10 million, by the time you've divided that up into several projects, there's not much money to go around to each individual project, is there? I think the, the goal of it is actually get those individual projects to hold transhuman coin. And as the value of transhuman coin goes up, their balance sheet values goes up as well. And so, we don't, you know, it disincentivizes the value of transhuman coin when they convert it back to US dollars or, or, or British pound, um, we're trying to convert back to fiat. If they keep it as THC and do a market valuation of their holdings, that allows them to borrow fiat against that value asset. They can also then, you know, increase their market cap to acquire other companies and uh, do other things with that market valuation. So that is sort of ultimately where I think we can actually drive this value. So even though the donations right now might be small, they might be, you know, if we think about three and a half million transhuman coin, might be $1,500. But as that transhuman coin continues to grow, that actually grow, um, grows with it exponentially. So we can actually continue to um, drive the adoption. We're at about 2,400 holders of transhuman coin. And if you think about our addressable market, our total addressable market is that 7 billion population. So yeah, at least another million to go, <laughs> more than that. Roman Bauer asks, how much of the 7 billion coins is held by the leadership and development team? And more generally, can you comment on the Gini coefficient or the inequality uh, aspect of uh, how the, the holding is distributed? Okay. Um, the, the leadership holds about 20%, out of which 30% of that 20% will be burnt. You know, uh, what, what we call burning is sending um, the THC to the transformer coin to a dead address. And that is to, uh, to, to create some sort of scarcity uh, which increases the value of the um, transhuman coin. So there is a wallet that holds, and that wallet is an unlisted wallet. You know, it's, it's an, it contains unlisted tokens, which is about 20% now because of the burning that is happening. Um, yesterday, they burned about 5 million TSC. Um, today, they've burned about over 4 million TSC. So there's a weekly, um, and, and most times twice in a week of burning, you know, and that is to create um, scarcity of the, of the transhuman coin and drive up the value, you know. And uh, the second question, please. Well, the second question was about the Gini coefficient. Gini is a measure of inequality, you know, whether the holding is, is spread widely or whether it's accumulated disproportionately in just a small number of holders. Okay. We don't have uh, that, a, a ready value for that, but an indication would be of interest to some of the audience. Yeah, the, 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 the redistribution of the 2% to holders uh, is actually equal, you know? So everyone, it doesn't matter how much you, you hold, you know, everyone gets an equal um, share of the 2% that is being distributed or redistributed. You know, everyone gets it. It's, it's automatic and it's encoded in the uh, smart contract, you know. So if it's equal, it's um, the yeah. same. And, and in terms of the, the underlying holdings of, uh, you know, if you think about transhuman coin as 100% holding, in total, like Charles says, 20% is currently with the team. The rest of those holdings are actually all um, majority under 1%. So there's probably about in the top 10 that holds the other, I think, 30% and the remaining holds under 1%. So that gives you a rough indication of how it's split at the moment. And the burning, like you say, was, was essentially drive down that holding of the 20%. Um, and as we continue to make these donations as part of these leadership teams, we'll be able to drive that teeny coefficient in the positive direction as well. And is the hold, are the holdings public? People yeah, can look you can and see, see these now on the um, Binance uh, scan. So it's the equivalent of the Ether scan, but for Binance Smart Chain. And uh, that's also on the website as well. Very good. 
Uh, Anton Kalaga asked another question about uh, should there be a scientific board that will potentially veto projects that might sound interesting, might sound uh, attractive, but actually have little uh, scientific validity? Or do you just trust the community's decision by the processes that you've already outlined? And this is where we want to uh, get more scientists on board as part of the management team and we can form that scientific advisory board. I think um, as part of this push, yeah, we'll be targeting scientific advisors. Um, right now, we've got some influences on board, like you say, but we also need people with the right scientific knowledge. Um, and Dr. Charles, I know you've uh, got a few contacts there as well that you'll be reaching out to. But, um, yeah, we're really open to suggestions around um, who we should bring on as part of the management team. So as part of this, please reach out. Um, and suggest some contacts. We're starting to do uh, su suggestions as well on who we can bring on as part of the management team. So with THC, we want to get them have skin in the game um, to make sure that they can actually hold it um, and actually support the movement itself. So if there are recommendations or volunteers for these roles, how do they get in touch with you? Yeah, so the website is www.transhumancoin dot finance and um, the admin can be reached at admin at transhumancoin dot finance and we do have a telegram um, group and that is t dot me slash that that's four slash by transhumancoin we, we, we are on twitter at transhumancoin and that is www.twitter.com slash um, transhumancoin and um, we are also on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash transhumancoin. And um, these are the most, and we are on Discord. And I think um, Peter can tell us the Discord channel. Yeah, and the Discord channel, we're just getting set up so we can actually form the development team, uh, create more marketing, but also around the organizations that we want to prioritize. The top voted question now is, uh, by Roman Bauer, who asks, how does the redistribution to holders work? Is it proportional to the amount they hold already, or do you all receive the same regardless of their current holding? Yeah, it's, it's equal, it's, it's, it's equal, it's, it's automated. So everyone just gets the same um, from the two percent, you know, and it, it's redistributed equally. So what's the advantage to somebody being a larger holder? Is that um, they literally have um, a, a big chunk of the cake, <laughs> you know, but, but the redistribution uh, is it's the economic incentive that the, the project offers to holders and not necessarily the, the main um, thing because the main thing is what you purchase and you know what what you've bought you know when you buy um, a million TSC I mean that's um you're buying into one seven uh, into seven billion you know you're buying one million out of the seven billion in circulation and um what we do or what our economics do is that it adds um two percent of every transaction out of every transaction um on that one million or 2 million or 10 million that you've bought, you know. Okay. Uh, there's a question from an anonymous attendee to ask you, Charles. Is uh, perceived corruption in Africa a barrier to effective charitable decisions? Okay. Um, well, there is a high level of corruption in some, in some parts of Africa, and I use the word some parts of Africa because um, there are some parts of Africa that are actually very um, developed. Like I, I live in South Africa, you know, and if, if you've been to South Africa, you know, it's, 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 it's well developed, you know, the systems are functional and um, technology, you know, controls most of the systems. So the corruption level here is very low. So yes, in some parts of Africa, you know, corruption, seem to um, scare away foreign donors, you know. But what, what, what we see in Africa now is that most, most African countries are no longer looking for foreign donations. They are, they are, they are, they are um, migrating, you know, from 
the, the donation mentality to partnership mentality, where they're saying, we, we don't really need free things. You know, we don't need the free things. We are looking for ways to um, grow our human capital, you know, train us, you know. So you see more countries not offering financial um, donations, you know, but offering things like training, you know, or trade, you know, and, and that makes it a bit um, safer to um, contribute to the growth of the continent, but without crying for loss, because any investment you make on human capital, you know, is a sure, great investment, you know. There are quite a few comments on YouTube as well. I'm not able to follow them all. By all means, if there's somebody else spots a comment on YouTube that should be fed into this uh, Zoom discussion as a priority, let me know. I'll pick a, a question there from GTR Frost who asks, will THC be on the Pulse network anytime soon? That may have been answered already, but let's ask it again. Yeah, that's um, like essentially part of the roadmap where we want to build partnerships with uh, pro-transhumanism organization blockchains like Pulse Chain. Um, so yes, yeah, um, Richard Hart's Hex is doing so well as well recently in his um, CD platform. Um, that's essentially a certificate of deposit. Um, that's going to be merged with Pulse Chain and actually offering lower transaction fees. So right now, Binance Smart Chain offers relatively small uh, transaction fees as well. But Pulse Chain, I think, aligning with them in the future where we have Richard Hart, that's actually pro longevity. That makes a lot of sense as well. So yeah, definitely in the roadmap with those other partnerships with the blockchain initiatives. I'll feed in one more comment from the YouTube before I go back to the Zoom questions and answers. Uh, Reasomatic Reality makes a very fair point. He says that there's corruption elsewhere in the world too, not just in Africa. There's certainly corruption in politics in various ways and corruption in business in various ways in parts of Europe, the UK and uh, America. And so that's uh, an obstacle to true progress uh, all, all over the world, not just in a few countries in Africa. So I think that that is a fair point. On the redistribution question, Roman uh, pops up again asking, well, what if somebody's got multiple wallets? Does that mean they will get uh, more redistributed to them? Don't know if that's uh, addressed in the white paper or other considerations. Yeah, I think, I think we address that. If, if, you mean, if someone has more TSC, would they have higher um, distribution I and mean, the distribution of 2%? That's the question. Um, we've just we've just addressed it and we said no. The two percent is redistributed equally. Yeah, and the multiple wallets issue as well. Like you say, David, um, you know, if because the wallets currently are pseudonymous, um, you know, we don't know who they are. They can create multiple wallets and buy, you know, lots of THC. They could potentially do that. This is where initiatives like Proof of Humanity, uh, as part of our iterations, will come in handy because Proof of Humanity can actually identify the individual holders. Um, that's currently on the Ethereum blockchain, but that's something we can work towards as well as part of our um, roadmap too. And that way we can actually prove that we're actually making a difference into unique humans <laughs> and supporting the transhumanism movement and um, with the 2% distributing to individual holders as well. Thanks. Brian from Canada raises a different set of questions which I think uh, deserves some attention from us. Uh, he points out that there have been similar slightly similar sounding projects which have led to lots of people sadly losing their life savings. Tens of millions of Indian farming peasants lost their life savings of about a hundred dollars each in Bitcoin before the government made crypto, the Indian government made cryptocurrency purchase illegal and they what protects vulnerable people from suffering from such a catastrophic loss with THC? We don't want a, a relatively impoverished people putting huge amounts of money in and then seeing it all disappear. After all, Brian says, if we are transhumanists, it's about ethics and ending suffering. We don't want people to suffer from a, making a, what turns out to be a misguided investment in transhuman coin. So I don't know if you want to play with that idea between the three of you for a bit. Yeah, um, you know, that's that happens when, you know, you've got your Bitcoins, for example, in a centralized exchange and the government takes over that centralized exchange and essentially effectively takes away your wallet as well. So the whole point of 
you know, these um, cryptocurrencies and the blockchain is essentially be decentralized from the government's central banks. Right now, if you have a wallet on your, uh, or via browser, for example, MetaMask or Trust Wallet, um, that, that can be traded on decentralized exchanges like PancakeSwap. And so that way, actually, it, as long as you don't lose your passwords, your private keys, um, you can actually keep that away from being taken away by the governments itself. So the risk is if you keep it in a centralized exchange, there's always that overarching risk that the governments take over it. So we would recommend if you do use a centralized exchange, for example, you know, when we list on Coinbit, you transfer it to a wallet that you can then protect against um, that centralized exchange going down. But I think Brian's question is a bit more than that. It's not just that the governments might intervene and take away or prevent people from uh, continuing to use cryptocurrency. The government interfere, intervened because they thought uh, many farmers would be defrauded of money or disappointed because they were investing in various ways which would then uh, almost certainly fail. So how, how, how can you be sure that people who invest in transhuman coin with a great vision for the future will not in a year or two's time be saying, gosh, I put all my life savings into this, expecting uh, the sky and I've got nothing out of it. This was a very bad uh, transhumanism indeed. Yeah, uh, thank you David for that question. And uh, Peter rightly mentioned one aspect where people um, risk losing their money and that's when governments make um, such policies, you know, and, and that is one aspect. And um, like Peter suggested or, or recommended that we um, withdraw from, we regularly withdraw from the um, centralized exchange wallets into, um, you know, what we call code wallets, you know, and that way we, we, we keep um, our, 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 our coins safe. Now the second aspect is what we call the rock pool, the rock pool. Now the rock pool is when someone, most times, you know, um, anonymous guy comes up and creates a coin and says, um, we are doing this and we are doing that, you know. And then they, 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 they grow the coin anonymously, you know, they have no face to it. They grow it anonymously and it gets to a point and they, 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 they pull out the liquidity, crashing value of the coin and everyone who had invested in that, in that project then goes on crying. That's what we call rock pool. And one of the technologies that we use to um, prevent rock pool is what we call the liquidity lock, right? We call it the liquidity lock. And um, we do have a 100% liquidity lock on the Transhuman Coin project. It's locked 100%, which means that at no point will developers pull it, you know. And no, number two is that we have what we call a dog team, you know. We are not anonymous. I have over 60,000 followers on, social, on, on Facebook alone. I have over 6,000 followers on Facebook, you know. I have I've been in the public space, you know, for many years. And from, from when I was, I was a child, literally, you know, I've been in public space because of my religious background, you know. And we have people like Peter and Alice, you know, who, who have done so much for the transhumanism um, project. Someone personally, like me, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be part of um, a project and put my face to it, you know, with everything that I've got. My, my, my family in South Africa, they are a well-respected political family. We are my, 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 my um, um, mother-in-law was a member of the national parliament. You know, she was a member of the national parliament and well respected. My family is well respected, you know, and I wouldn't put a face to it if, um, and as a cyber security expert, I hadn't done my research. So the assurance we're giving to everyone is that um, there is no, there will never be a time when there will be a rough pool, never, never, you know. We're going to do our best to grow the project, you know. And we are going to make sure that we are ethical because we are looking at the long term. You know, we, we, we've always said that this is beyond just a crypto project. We, we are using just the blockchain technology, technology to generate the funds that we, we want to use to do good in society. You know, this is beyond um, crypto. We, we are driven by an honest passion, you know, as transhumanists to do good 
in our generation. And a lot of people asked me, Charles, are you saying that you're going to solve death? You know, I said, no, but we may die trying to solve it. We'd rather die trying to solve it, <laughs> you know, than not make any attempt or contribute anything to um, the coming generation to find a solution to human's greatest limitations. So I hope that answers your question, uh, Mr. David. Well, it is a good answer in the sense that I think it uh, shows your integrity. It shows your honesty. But people can lose money in financial transactions, not just because they're being ripped off by somebody who's set out to deceive them. They can lose money because in the end, the scheme is uh, somehow misguided or naive or it thinks it's different, but it isn't. And so at this stage, I'm going to feed in a question from YouTube by Steph Kodija, Staker app, who points out, he says that since 2016, all cryptocurrencies focused on charity or research have failed. So I, I, I don't know what their data points no. are here. I don't know which ones you would that, point to. But that Steph is, Steph is saying, is so it's not true. You say you, there are yeah, other... That's not true because actually I, 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 I have researched others and I may not mention their names, you know. And um, a lot of them have been listed by um, centralized exchanges and they are doing pretty well. In fact, this is, this is a fact. What I'm about to share right now is a fact, you know. Um, if Mimi coins, and these are just funny, you know, <laughs> jokes that just start from, I mean, your, your Dutch coin, your Shiba, you know, these are Mimi coins, you know, and they have no real, real, real uh, impact, you know, on humanity, you know. If they can do well and, and last long in the market, how much more and honest, there are many of them, uh, I, I, I just, just don't want to mention names, but I can submit that, you know, to anyone who um, wants to know, you know, there are many um, charity coins, because when it comes to research coins, we may be the, 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 the major coin that is dedicated to research. I haven't seen much of the research coins, but I've seen much of the charity coins. And remember, we are not just a charity coin, we are a charity and research coin, you know, and the research niche, is very peculiar to the transhuman coin, you know. But the, the, the charity coins, you know, that are doing well are there. There is the one that, you know, gives more uh, to offerings. And right now they've raised, uh, in just a month or so, you know, they've raised millions. Their, 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 their market cap is in hundreds of millions of dollars. They are listed by major exchanges. And these were just created by two young black um, um, varsity students, and they are doing good among orphans. You know, um, one of them was an orphan and um, experienced very um, crazy upbringing. And he said, "I'm going to create a project that helps orphans to fund the education and do other stuff." And it's doing so well. And there are others, you know. So whoever thinks or says that um, charity um, um, projects, you know. Should also remember that Dogecoin well, is not is not a charity project. It's it's a mini project, and mini projects are do, doing well, you know. And and what makes a project work? Let me say this: are the people behind it? Are the people behind it? Not really, you know. Is first is the people behind it, you know. We have a great community, and not just that, we have great and respected individuals who are backing the transhuman coin, you know. And, and, and what, what defines the, the major um, failures of any coin? One is most times, you see, the people behind it are not, they, they do not have a, 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 um, the, the influence, you know, the, both on social media and all that to drive traffic to their projects. You know, so they have like 100 or 200 people in their communities and they're trying to do it one month, two months. You know, because they do not have influence. Influence. The, the, the crypto industry is driven by influence. You know, and, and what we have in ours is the influence. We do have influence, I and mean, a lot of influencers are behind us. You know, in just one month, we 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 have grown to 0 0.0003 dollar to one um, transhuman coin. You know, and the transition. You know. I mean, the traction and the trajectory of, of, of the project has been massive, you know, and that's because of um, the, the influence that the leaders have in their social spheres. Our Telegram uh, group has over 3,000 people on it, 
you know. Well, maybe we and, stick with this a little bit longer, and maybe I can ask both Elise and uh, Peter to give their views on this as well. The, as an investor, uh, well, what investors want to do, they want to evaluate the caliber of the team, of course. They want to see what connections the team have got. That's a plus. But investors usually want to say, well, who else has tried this kind of thing before? Because even if a team is very talented, works hard, has got good connections, if there's a fundamental issue with the model, with the architecture, then it's going to fail. And I'm sure there have been other coins in which there was initial very exciting growth. And so the question again is, maybe in your future communications, you can say a little bit more about comparisons between previous projects. I noticed that uh, GTR Frost uh, refers to a previous coin called Humanic, which was a charity coin. And he says, well, it did very badly. And there may have been an exciting and encouraging start point. So I think you've got to make it clear, not just that you are great people individually, which no doubt you are, but that you've understood what the limitations of previous uh, broadly similar coins were and how you expect to transcend these limitations with a particular approach you're bringing. Any comments on that? Yeah. I mean, a couple of examples, um, you know, we talked about Pulse Chain earlier and that's already raised $25 million for Sense Foundation. Poor case study of what happened afterwards, but, um, you know, at least that it's demonstrating that it has been able to achieve uh, what it set out to do. There's then also Dogelon Mars. So uh, that was <laughs> essentially set out as a meme token that Charles mentioned. But now Methuselah Foundation is stewarding that token and it's continued to, to actually sustain its price. I mean, that um, Dogelon Mars token, although it did go through that ramp up and the hype cycle, it's still maintaining that price. And Methuselah Foundation has actually kept on to say they're going to hold that for another year. So that is also initially started as a meme, but turned into a charity token for the Methuselah Foundation. What we want to do is have a dedicated coin for transhumanism from the outset. And, uh, you know, learning the lessons, you know, from the, the, the hype coins like SafeMoon, we don't want to be one of those scam tokens where all it's doing is driving, you know, with these reflection mechanisms to actually just accumulate for the holders. We want to make sure that that donation wallet accumulates so we can actually do this transfer to those transhuman organizations and have them hold on to this coin too, and, and increasing that balance sheet mechanism. So this is actually the first time we're actually applying it in a transhuman context, but also making sure that that holding and market valuation becomes the value of where this token goes. Alexandria Black in the questions says that she had a, her own experience. She was a moderator in an Ethereum group which had high hopes for social projects, but then there was a lot of pump and dump and the project did not live up to the expectations. I don't know the name of that. So again, the question is, how can you be sure your fine goals can't be subverted? And possibly the answer is uh, what was raised by an anonymous attendee in a different question, which is, are you going to make your technology open source? I mean, you're, you're doing various things there. You're encoding various uh, processes. Uh, is that available for people to look at and to say, well, actually there is something different and unique here? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, the, the, the code is on the um, Binance Smart Chain and you can read the code there, you know, on, on, on the Binance Smart Chain. So it's, it's, it's open on the on Binance Smart Chain. And um, secondly, with um, the pump and dump thing that happens in cryptocurrencies, you know, we, we are seeing a completely organic growth, a completely organic growth in um, the transhuman coin, you know, and we've done everything possible to ensure that we do not have the pumps, you know, the pumps, we've not, we, we, we do not allow it, we, don't, we, we will not allow it, you know. And that is because we, we have a long-term vision, you know, and the, 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 the pump and dump um, things will not happen in, in the project. And that's because of the character, again, of those who are behind it. We will not allow that, and um, it won't happen in our projects. But how do you prevent really yourselves... How do you prevent yourselves from being bought out or manipulated so that you'll find... Uh, uh, ambitions uh, then get subverted. Yeah, and that and that go get um, again goes to the individual characters. You know, if we essentially you know um, become disloyal to this coin, that ruins our reputations as well. 
So I think we're individually tied and we make sure that the influences we bring on board and the scientific advisors that we bring on board to the management team also has that. It's early days in this sort of first month of launch, but I think that's where we're essentially going to be going to as well. So we're coming to the end of the 90 minute session. Uh, I'll give you all a chance in due course to make some concluding remarks, things that you think maybe have got lost in the discussion that you'd like to re-emphasize. I will feed in a couple of comments from uh, various sources. Uh, Steph uh, from Staker App says that when he looked at your website, the distribution pie chart adds up to 205%. So I don't know if that's been checked recently. He says that doesn't make the best of uh, impressions. So I don't know if he's reading it differently from how it's intended. So I know it's early days and maybe you could do with some more people helping out, but uh, checking whether that adds up or not. So that's a fair point. Rebel Coda uh, mentions somebody you've already mentioned, Peter, earlier on. He mentions Charles Hoskinson of Cardano. And he says they are focused on good works in Africa. They've started already some amazing projects uh, why aren't you working more closely with them? So I, I think obviously you want to work with them and it's just a matter of time. But any, any comments on that before I feed in a couple more questions and then let you wind up? Yeah, big fan of uh, Charles and his work in the Kadana community. Um, so yeah, that's something that we want to work cross-chain. So essentially Kadano uh, with Ethereum 2.0 and Binance Smart Chain. So this way we can interoperate between those three prominent transhumanist uh, blockchains as well as Pulse Chain. So we want transhuman coin to transcend all these, I guess, silos of blockchain networks. You know, Cardano will become cross-chain as well. So that's going to be a great goal for us to tack on to. And can you say more about your cooperation or expected cooperation with Vita Dow? That's uh, yes. something that Anton Kulaga is, a concern, is involved with. He says they have a project for their first investment uh what's your relationship uh, envisioned to be there yeah that's going to be amazing so we're going to be working through them uh through lifespan.io it's still early days we're just still in contact with lifespan.io and uh with uh, with uh, vita dow as well so um i know vita dow has got that governance framework of how to invest in these early stage and they've got the ocean protocol the data marketplace that goes through uh, and how that formulates for uh aging research um Ultimately, we want also to be an integrate transhuman coin as that holding token to bring value rather than just the governance side of what Vita Dow is doing. Good. So in a minute, as I say, I'll give you a chance to make concluding statements. I do want to tell people, if you are watching on Zoom, we are going to transition uh, into a different mode. And I will give everybody who's still on the call the chance to come on camera. Now, I'm not expecting all the panelists to stay because it's very late at night in some places, but they are, of course, welcome to stay for a bit. And we might uh, hang around in this uh, more informal setting for 30 minutes or 40 minutes or so just for people to make their own thoughts and what, what are they thinking now as a result of what they've heard? What do they wish was added into the conversation? What other angles should be laid? So that will involve everybody who is still a member of the audience being transformed. You will get a message from Zoom saying you are invited to become a panelist. And if you accept that, you will be transitioned. But we'll take a break first, by the way. We won't go straight into that. So we'll stop at about half past the hour and maybe after about seven minutes or so when people have recharged their coffee, had a bio break, then we'll kick that off again. But let's go, let's go around. Let's have some concluding remarks from Elise. What have you heard that you would like to respond to? And what else would you like to leave in people's minds, Elise? Yeah, so what I love about THC is that you benefit both as a holder, but also the, the charities and organizations that we are donating to, they also benefit from holding as well. And so in a lot of developing countries but also in developed countries you don't really have that advantage where you can choose between well do i donate to worthy causes or do i need to think about investing in my own future so at the same time you can actually do both using thc wonderful uh charles concluding remarks from you yeah cryptocurrency is a feature but beyond that, transhumanism is the future. So 
when we merge crypto and transhumanism, we have a future that is not just secured, but a future that is going to be amazing to walk into. So that's my last word. Think the future and think transhumanism. Think transhumanism and think transhuman coin. Thank you. But has that message resonated well? Does that, because uh, sometimes people say transhumanism is scary and they would rather not bring it up. But uh, what, 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 what's your experience in uh, mentioning transhumanism? Is it being well received or, or not? Well, um, because of the religiosity of, of Africa, it's, it's a bit scary to people. And, and this is what the transhuman coin is doing. Now, with more African holders, I mean, we have over um, 1,800 African holders out of the 2,000 and plus, um, 2,600 or thereabouts holders, you know. What they are doing is, they first say, I just bought the transhuman coin. Oh, great, I'm a transhumanist. Then they, they begin to assimilate and adopt the ideology of human enhancement through science and technology. And it's spreading like wildfire because of the economic incentive that the transhuman coin provides. So, you know, once, once, once they receive that economic incentive, it becomes more um, endearing to them, you know, and that's what we're seeing with the project. So before now, actually, I used, I used to just be a lonely voice. You know, I mean, a lonely voice in transhumanism. I would say this, ah, no, you are not born again, or you backslided from the Christian faith or something like that, you know, then, but slowly they're going to realize that, you know, we're just questioning um, the human limitation. Like, is this all there is to life? Is this all there is to humans? Is there something more that we can achieve with our bodies, our minds, you know, and our consciousness, you know, and, and the ideology I'm telling you right now in Africa, it's spreading because of the transhuman coin project. And that's the major significance is to spread the ideology using the most um, sensitive aspects of the African reality, which is economic, you know, reality here. And that combination, that, that strategy has worked like fire. It's working, you know. So, yeah, it's, it's now being received. But before now, it wasn't, you know, but it's gradually, you know, being adopted into the thought pattern in Africa. Thank you, Charles. Uh, Peter, what are your concluding remarks? And maybe what do you think will be the case in about a year's time if we were to have this conversation in a year's time? What would be different then from what we're having now? Yeah, and Charles Elise said it so well. I think, you know, it's, it's such a great honour to have this forum and getting the feedback from the community, David. And yet, I think, you know, year's time, we'll have more and more of the community leaders, part of the management team, to guide this project because it is a project for transhumanism as a movement and we want to accelerate the movement. Um, so, yeah, please reach out to us um, through that admin email that uh, we've listed in the chat uh, to come on board and join the team. I think we all definitely need that scientific advisory board, we'll definitely find a way to make that mechanism that's equitable and also make sure we don't have the, the fallings of previous charity tokens like it's mentioned in the group. We want to make sure we get this right because it's transhumanism, it's part of our lives. So it's going to be, you know, for me, I'm going to be holding this coin for life. And it's about how do we get other people to hold that as well. Yeah. I just want to say thank you for the questions, the tough questions, especially all the feedback. So I've been taking notes. I haven't been talking as much as Charles and Peter today, but I'm just thinking about all the feedback and how we can learn from it and apply it to THC. So thank oh. you. That's excellent. I've got a copy of the YouTube chat. I've got a copy of the Q&A, including the questions that we didn't get around to, and the chat, text chat, which I will forward to all three of you. Feel free to look at as much of it catches your eyes. And I agree very much with what you've said, Elise. We are going to be successful to the extent that we can learn from the wider community. This is not a competition. We're not trying to be better than the other coins. We're trying to forge the right collaborative links with these other projects in a distinctive way that will add real value that can be shared. And so I will, I will share that. But I want to thank the three of you for taking the time to get involved. And you've heard the links. Uh, I will put the links uh, clearly in the description of this video and put them online. 
and I'm now going to close down the recording and close down the media channels, but I'll keep the Zoom running. It's now half past the hour according to my watch at 37 minutes past the hour. I will convert everybody who's still here into panelists and we can have a little bit more of an informal chat. So thanks to everybody. Thank you.